Good morning, Hertfordshire, and welcome to part three of the Hertfordshire Forward Conference 2020. Today's session is titled Diversity, Working Together for a Safe and Inclusive County of Opportunity. My name is Toby Fox, and I'm your facilitator for 90 minutes of presentation and discussion about making sure that Hertfordshire recovers better. The aim of these sessions is to consider issues and challenges for the county and determine how they can be addressed in partnership with you to ensure that Hertfordshire remains the county of opportunity. We want to make sure that all our partners out there are aware of the issues of the day and that your voices are heard when we consider solutions to our challenges. Now, I usually make a flippant remark at this point to introduce a light-hearted tone and make this easier listening for you. But there's no easy listening on the impact of COVID-19 and what it's done to our Black and Asian <clears throat> ethnic minority communities. Public Health England says that the risk of dying amongst those diagnosed with COVID-19 was higher in those in BAME groups than in white ethnic groups. After accounting for the effect of sex, age, deprivation and region, Public Health England found that people of Bangladeshi ethnicity were most at risk, about twice as likely to die compared with people of white British ethnicity. People of Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, other Asian, Caribbean and other black ethnicities had between 10 and 50% higher risk of death when compared with white British. Now, ethnicity might not be, uh, it might only be one of, of many factors contributing to these findings, but there can be no doubt, and we have to acknowledge that there exists deeply ingrained and often unconscious discrimination across all levels of society. As leaders representing a diverse community, you have an important role to play in dismantling these biases and systemic oppression. We must all endeavour to make sure that Hertfordshire is a safe and inclusive county of opportunity for residents. We've got a long way to go before we can truly say that we've achieved that goal. We should all be committed to doing our bit to achieve this and to play our part in the hard task of removing racism and discrimination from our society. So let's hear today from our community leaders about the diversity of our county and the work underway seeking to ensure inclusivity and from partners what you consider should be our response as a county. We're gonna be polling you viewers at midday to get a sense of your feelings and the direction of travel you'd encourage and support. And your responses to those polls and your questions through the Q and A function on your screens, which we encourage you to make use of throughout the morning, will fuel a conversation with our panel in the final section of today's event. But first, you need to meet our panel. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to welcome today, Lionel Wallace DL, the aeronautical engineer, who will inspire us with suggestions of how we should respond as individuals and as a county to improve our record on inclusivity. And welcome Elaine Hickling, Business Improvement Manager, Hertfordshire County Council and Registered Social Worker, who will present a case study on the work of the council's Black Asian and Ethnic Minority Staff Network. And welcome, Kate Bellinis, uh, DL, Chair of Hertfordshire Equality Council and CEO of Community Development Action Hertfordshire, who's going to describe for us the diversity of the county. But first, please join me in welcoming our leader, Councillor David Williams, to set the scene for us. David, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Toby, and, and good morning and welcome colleagues to this third and final webinar in the Hertfordshire Forward Autumn series, organised with the help of Three Fox. As Toby said in his introduction, the theme for today's webinar is diversity and how we can achieve a safe and inclusive county of opportunity for all of our residents. Hertfordshire is a diverse place and our demography ref reflects a broad range of people from different backgrounds. This year with the Black Lives Matters campaign and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19, there has never been a more important time to support and listen to our Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities. We've heard concerning reports regarding hate crimes and incidents being perpetrated in relation to the virus. This follows on from spikes in hate crime following the EU referendum in 2016 and the terrorist attacks of 2017. As leaders of, in our communities, we have an important role to play in challenging inequalities and working together to tackle racism. This webinar is an opportunity for partners to hear from community leaders about the diversity of our county, the work underway seeking to advance inclusivity and for partners to consider what our response should be as a county. 
We're delighted to be joined today by Lionel Wallace, a Deputy Lieutenant of Hertfordshire and a respected community leader who will be challenging us for our response later this morning. Please do take part today, answering the questions posed and also putting questions to us. At a time when Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities globally are expressing their anger and frustration with institutional racism, which disproportionately affects them, I'd like to take this opportunity to restate our condemnation of racism, discrimination and hatred in all its forms. Hertfordshire County Council is committed to continued action in tackling inequality and championing diversity and inclusion throughout the council, both as a large employer of people and also as a provider of services. We celebrate the fact that our staff and our communities are all very different. We strive to demonstrate equality and diversity in everything we do, making our services accessible for everyone and ensuring our policies and practices are anti-discriminatory and inclusive. Earlier this year, the council unanimously signed a declaration underlying our values of equality and inclusion. At the time, we had been experiencing a rise in anti-Semitism across the country, while more recent events have highlighted once again the sad truth that discrimination and racism still looms large, particularly against members of the black community, both abroad and at home in the UK. Given this, it's even more important to restate our commitment to all elements of diversity and inclusion. We recognize that all people are individual and their needs can be complex and varied. For the benefits of diversity to be felt, we want an environment where differences of thought and outlook are not only respected, but are expected and valued. Feeling included is good for us as individuals, it's good for our teams, and it's good for the people and communities that we serve. Following the horrendous news and images from America of the death of George Floyd and the subsequent reactions, our Chief Executive Owen Mapley wrote to all County Council staff restating the commitment of the Council to all elements of diversity and inclusion, including a determination to condemn racism where we see it, but also to develop and maintain a proactive anti-racist approach across the Council. I issued a public statement and then all 11 leaders of the district borough and county councils in Hertfordshire, plus the police and crime commissioner, issued a joint statement against every form of discrimination, racism and injustice. I know that all these organisations continue to drive inclusivity and I'm sure as well as many of the organisations, I'm sure as well that many of these organisations are represented here today. A key part of this work is acknowledging the hard truth that there are inequalities within our own organisations and our communities. These inequalities can only begin to be addressed by speaking to and understanding members of our workforce and our residents who have been systematically disadvantaged because of their ethnicity. We must also recognise alongside the threat of overt racism, there exists deeply ingrained and often unconscious discrimination across all levels of society. As a county council representing a diverse community, we have an important role to play in dismantling biases and systematic oppression. We have a long way to go before we can truly say we've achieved this goal, but we are committed to doing our part to achieve this and play our part in the hard task of removing racism and discrimination from our society. Black History Month in October was celebrated with new vigour at the County Council and we'll be hearing more about that from Elaine Hickling who works for the County Council uh, later this morning. Black History Month provides us with an opportunity to recognise the contribution of black people to British society to reflect on the history of our diverse communities and the different journeys individuals have been on. Understanding the past helps us to shape and define a more just and equitable future. As a large employer, we have set out our internal diversity and inclusion strategy for our workforce. In practice, this means both working to ensure that HCC is free from discrimination across our workforce, but also doing what we can to positively promote equality and diversity of the services we deliver. 
The council recognizes there is a long way to go to achieve this goal, but is firmly committed to doing its best and playing its part in the hard task of removing racism and discrimination in all parts of Hertfordshire society. To this end, we're working on our external diversity and inclusion strategy for all our residents. This strategy is currently open for consultation. We're inviting everyone to take part in the survey detailed on HCC's website. The survey is asking you to inform us how we might deliver a new strategy that will see us working with our communities to ensure that our services are responsible to our diverse population and working with partners to make Hertfordshire a safe and inclusive county for all. Officers and community leaders, including uh, Kate B Belenis, who's also a Hertfordshire DL, uh, who we'll be hearing from later, have been working collaboratively to set up a new network to start the process of building community capacity and, and a better understanding of Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities in Hertfordshire. The pandemic may have left some local communities disengaged and somewhat skeptical of past engagement with public services. The network plans to start the process of helping to rebuild that trust, fairness, and reduce fear of accessing health and other public services in the aftermath of COVID-19. A number of work streams have been established, including commissioning research to deepen our understanding of the wider socioeconomic determinants, improving data collection on ethnicity, occupation and faith in all routine clinical data, and also working with all sectors to produce a countywide approach that promotes inclusion and has zero toler tolerance of racism. This year, we've seen Formula One driver Lewis Hamilton, who of course hails from Stevenage, named as the most influential black person in Britain by the Power List 2021, the annual list of the most powerful people of African, African Caribbean and African American heritage in the UK. As well as launching the Hamilton Commission to improve diversity in UK motorsport, he persuaded his team to support his stand in the Black Lives Matter campaign in highly visible ways. For an entire season, the Mercedes-Benz cars have been repainted black from their traditional silver to acknowledge the importance of anti-racism campaigns around the world. So here's the challenge for all of us. What further actions should we be taking in Hertfordshire? This webinar is an opportunity for us to consider what actions we should all be taking to contribute to, to contribute to the removal of racism and discrimination from our society. What is our response as a county and what actions uh, are we going to take as individuals? Those are the questions we need to be addressing this morning. Thank you, Toby. Thanks very much indeed, David. That's um, that's terrific. And and audience, you'll have to forgive us um, for setting such a grim and, and somber tone um, this this morning. But it's uh, it's grim and somber that we have to have this conversation uh, at all. Um, but of course, it's also as, as well as an opportunity to to, to look at, um, at at where we need to take action. It's an opportunity to to, to do some celebrating as well over the work that, that has been done and, and to celebrate things like Black History Month and the achievements of of Lewis Hamilton. Um, and we'll, we will get to uh, to some of that celebration later in this presentation. We're going to hear some really exciting work that, that's that's been done in, in Hertfordshire. Um, but to, to get us to that point, um, it's a real pleasure to bring to the stage Kate uh, Bellinis, uh, who is the chair of um, Hertfordshire Equality Council and CEO of, of CDA Hearts. Kate, um, you're going to set the scene for us in terms of the diversity of the county and, and give us a bit of the background. Thank you, David, for setting the scene. Um, um, I'm chair of Hearts Equality Council, which is an independent charity dealing with and helping people from the protected groups. And that includes people with race, religion, age, disability, LBGT and gender. So we're working with the grassroots communities to find their way through the equality Act of 2010 and also working with the public sector agencies. Um, I do have a day job and I'm the CEO of Community Development Action Hertfordshire and we've been dealing and working with communities right across Hertfordshire both in rural and urban settings. So without further ado 
So what does diversity look like in 2020 in Hertfordshire? Here are some numbers and throughout the, my presentation, the numbers are based on the census of 2011 and the Office of National Statistics. So I haven't made them up. I've had them from a reliable source. But as you can see, last year, 2019, 19% of our 1.2 million population, 228 people are from the diverse backgrounds and, and communities. The highest population live around Watford, and I've identified the three highest um, percentages there, three wards. So you've got Nascot, North Watford, West Watford, and Hart Hatfield North now has come into, into the numbers. And the lowest population live in, in Buntingford at 2.13%. And I'm not sure whether we all are aware of the number of languages spoken in, in schools predominantly. So the top three languages are Polish, Urdu and Romanian. And for those of you in the audience, and we can't see you sadly, um, I thought if I broke it down in districts, you might see the top three languages um, that, that are spoken. There's a thread there that the, the Polish are the highest. Um, Bengali there, Gujarati, Portuguese, and Tamil and Urdu. And in Welland Hatfield now, we've got Chinese and Arabic. 20% of children from uh, the Black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, many of them, because of language, need additional support in speech and communication. Now, this slide it gives you um, the GCSE. They've changed, and I'm trying quickly to try and keep up with how, how the um, achievements are measured. The baseline is zero, as you can see. Um, and that gives you some feeling of how the different communities are performing in terms of education. However, there's some other stats here. And the children from Black, Asian, minority, ethnic groups, 16% are children looked after. 15% referrals are to social care and 16% are children in need. The impact of COVID on remote learning is, is being quite dramatic. Um, and I hear that some primary and secondary age children are, are reluctant to do the remote learning. And if it's via Zoom uh, meetings, et cetera, because they don't really want to share their home settings to their peers. Um, Educational achievements, my stats may be a little bit out, but Pakistani boys and travelers are still two groupings of concern. I thought this would be of interest to all of us. Now these are percentages of households where no people in the household have English as their main language. You, you can see the figures for East of England on the left, and then we've got England and then Hertfordshire. And the highest number there, over 7% live in, in the Watford area. You know, the data, data is available. And my, my question is to my colleagues in the voluntary sector and also in the public sectors, how, how, how do we use this data? Has it been used? We know the impact of the last 10 years um, and the, the austerity cuts has, has major impact on the communities. The phenomenal amount of barriers to overcome. And the question is, what sort of intervention, what action has been taken, you know, with all this data that's, that's around us? And I apologize for this really busy um, and it's and it's broken down into district, but there's another slide if the other districts are feeling, oh, she's left us out. I haven't. 
right, what does this all mean? And it's broken down into Asian black minority mix um, and, and the ethnicity and migration. And if you just look, um, the, the figures, I'll just hone in on Broxbourne, the first Asian. That's the number of people. Oh, please bear in mind, these are figures from 2011. So they are quite, quite old. You can see that's 2,100 and it represents 2.3% of the population in Broxbourne. Those with long-term illness is 11.4% and that makes up of, of the 15.5%. I won't get bogged down with these figures, but what's really significant is the overcrowded households. You can see 14.5% is, is, uh, is nearly double the 8.1% of the, of the population. And if you go along the, the, the columns, you know, the black population there, it's 22.6. It's, you know, nearly treble. And if you work your way down, um, you can see in, in North Hearts, um, overcrowded there, the, the, the population is 4.9, but from the black communities, it's 14.8%. So these figures need to be really scrutinized and, and public health um, understand. And right at the end column, um, it just highlights the, the percentage increase um, and then as Watford was um, the highest uh, collection uh, of communities, if you look along there, um, second column down, Watford, black communities, it's 26.2% overcrowded households. And if you look at Asian, it's 22.8. Again, these are quite significant um, figures that really needs to be looked at. I hope this gives you a flavor and those who are working in the public health and those of us who are from the communities, you know, we need to understand what the problems and issues are. I mean, if, if we think about an individual um, from an Asian or black communities, if you have been tested positive, you live in a house, it's say a three bedroom house, and, and you already got three generations of people living there. How do you self-isolate? There's one kitchen, there's one bathroom, there's three bedrooms. How do people actually manage to self-isolate? It's not, not easy. Now these, I mean, David, you, you talked about hate crime. Uh, these are the figures we have um, at the moment. It's 1500 and you can see the percentage, the highest is racial. I have to tip my hat off to these people who have actually reported the crime. There are so many people that don't. For whatever reason, it's mainly no one will believe me. If the police, um, they, they're not interested in. And we, people from the communities and I hear their stories um, well, what's the point, Kate? Because of my skin tone, my skin colour, I have to experience this every day of my life. And can you imagine the impact of this as, as a child? Why are they calling me names, mum, dad? Why, 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 why? And many adults are now having to find their coping strategies of how to overcome this daily and totally unnecessary name calling, stereotyping, and, and you know, oh, well, because you're black, you, oh, you might be carrying a, a knife, for instance, and if you're a young black boy, oh, you know, so stereotyping, and then it's played out. And where do we go to find some recourse on this? This is now a 38% increase for the same period last year. And again, you can see, see the other, other figures there. Um, we have racism in Hertfordshire. There's no two ways about it. And it's how do we all hear about it? And what are we going to do? We need to improve the confidence in reporting. We need to have that 
ability and enabling environment that we can actually report a crime. And racism is the most difficult one to actually articulate and to make sure that the, the authorities actually believe and, and understand that. The Black Lives Matters, there were about 40, 40 events in Hertfordshire and I really, again, take my hat off to the young people. They were really steered and geared to make, make the voices heard. However, out of the sort of 40, there was one major incident um, and, and it was a little, well, it wasn't little, it was, it was nasty, it was horrible and frightening. And more frightening is for us in the community to then realize that there are people nearby who have far right extremist thoughts and deeds and think it's okay to, to do the abuse uh, and be so offensive. And the impact on those young people on that particular event is, is going to be with them for a very, very long time. And young children, especially, you know, they get the verbal, verbal abuse in streets, in schools, in shops, in, in their every, everyday life. Um, things, things must change. Just to give you a little bit of a, um, of a picture about what, what's, what, what does it look like in Hertfordshire. I hear now that there's a definition being queried and challenged. I am black. I am not a member of the black Asian minority ethnic group. And then you've got Asians saying, well, I'm not black. I'm, I'm Asian, I'm brown. So these are another bits of conversations that we need to have and better understanding of, of this classific classification. The story in Hearts, well, 10 years ago, there were 76 BME active organization groups, communities, and end of last year, there's 19 that's left delivering services. And then there is a difference between groups actually delivering a service and there are other groups that provide, it's a big posh word, infrastructure support. What does that mean? It enables, enables groups to, to, in, to carry out whatever they want to do for their own, own groups. There was a BME infrastructure charity in each district. So there were 10. And today there's only two district base, one in Stevenage and one in North Hearts. And the countywide one is Hearts Equality Council. The recent survey from Hart, Hartfordshire Community Foundation and the people who responded to that, and I don't have the figures whether the response was from the BME communities, but the, responded, the responders on, to that survey said 40% of them don't think they're going to be around um, post-March. So you can imagine we, we are not in a good place to survive or this health crisis in, in particular. Um, the impact of COVID, uh, um, David and Toby refer to the public health report. I'm not going to go into that there. There's enough data there now for us to, to look into and to work with. Um, we know overcrowding, is, is a huge issue, um, vitamin D and, and other aspects. So there's more to be than I'm not from the health sector, so I'm not going to go down there. There was a community impact service and you, a survey, and you can see the, the outcomes from that survey. And it is, as you say, it, you need to engage with communities and people at a local level, because in the last 10 years, people have felt their voices have um, been lost. They're no longer at the table where services are being are designed and developed. 
So there's no understanding um, about what the need, real need is. So there has to be this better understanding of the communities. And as I've covered before, racism. And also better communication of local places of worship and, and the social distancing rules and dig digital services have all, all been impactful. There is this new community reassurance cell because there's a determination to how we're going to, what we're going to look like, how we're going to work, how we're going to live um, and make sure services are there. So the cell, um, sorry, that's the government speak, is they've concentrated on, on four elements there. So there's got to be an action plan now. Mental health is huge, not only, you know, it's the young people and the, the rest of us age group. This is going to be a huge financial hardship as people lose their jobs and loneliness as well. Currently, what's come out, you know, real people have pulled their, um, all their energy to make sure that we look after each other, you know, set aside all the differences, etc. We just pulled ourselves together and did stuff. So mutual aid groups have, um, have emerged. And just a couple of uh, examples there. One vision in Watford, local people got together and everybody from the local authority to the community groups have set up this. This is amazing. If you want to just go Google one, one vision. I know in St Albans, they're trying to do the same within the Muslim community. And in Stevenage, there's a new... Uh, program coming through looking at the legacy about and mental health and the trauma that the black community have um, gone through and black lives I've mentioned before. So the Cards Equality Council has got some funding so we're going to be looking at grassroots and hearing from the communities themselves from the protect, protected group and there's another grant from a national pot Thank you, um, to look at capacity building and supporting the, the infrastructure. Um, I'm sure I'm running out of time. Going forward, this, this is really what we would like to see, that we all have the self-determination to make a difference. We can do this. In the workplace, we need to get all the staff to, to buy in. Another suggestion, seek and name champions in each department and better still connect with the communities talk to them have this active listening they're not crazy ideas they're just sharing with you their stories and how it was for them if we are going to go through these very difficult conversations but if we are determined we will get through this but it's you know long, long in the making. There was stuff going on before COVID and COVID has just morphed it into what it is now. But have the action plan and we do have some good stuff going on in Hertfordshire, you know, so we should spend some time and celebrate. Have, have a good time. But what I'm pleading with everybody is to do the active listening and then try to form um, appropriate action plans. And I'm nearly there with my last slide. This is so important. It's not what you said, not what you did, but it's how you made an individual or a group of people feel. Thank you. Very much indeed some really stirring uh, information there and, and there's a lot of chat going on um, amongst our viewers on um, some really difficult issues that you you you, you pulled out for us there um that, that people are, are trying to deal with and, and just almost at random the fact that black house households in north hertfordshire are three times more likely uh than the population to be uh, living in overcrowded conditions and and in st, st. albans almost four times as likely to have a long-term illness is is really all we need to know isn't it um, 38% increase in hate crimes. It's, it's so distressing. Um, and 75% fewer active organizations to, to, to help our communities uh, at, at this time. It, it's a, it's a, a, a real kind of uh, perfect storm. 
Uh, but as you say, good stuff is going on. And I'm yeah. really looking forward to hearing about some of that good stuff. Um, and that's what Elaine is here for, I think, to, uh, to kick us off with um, some information about the work that she's been doing uh, at Hertfordshire County Council with uh, your network, Elaine. The stage is- Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Toby. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting us here today. I'm really pleased to be here to give an update on the work of the uh, Black and Minority Ethnic Staff Group, otherwise known as Spain. Um, just to say the network group is for people from African, Caribbean, Asian, Southeast Asian and other minority communities. The staff network group has taken on a new shape in the past 18 months, which has led to a number of new and exciting initiatives. The COVID pandemic and the death of George Floyd this year has had a significant impact globally and um, in Hertfordshire too. Um, what we've seen in Hertfordshire is an increase in the numbers of staff joining our network group and our allies as well being involved with the group. Our group membership has increased by threefold in the last six months. Um, so I've said already what, what, we, what we are. Our group is about working with staff um, from the Black and Minority Ethnic Communities. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who is involved. I'm also going to say a little bit about our committee, um, just to share some Hertfordshire data um, very briefly um, this morning, to share our huge achievements in 2020, to tell you a little bit about our strategy um, that we have, and to share some of our successes from the Black History Month events this year, and then to conclude with some next steps. So who is involved? Um, we have our committee, um, a small group of us have been working together for over the past um, 18 months. We have our Black and Minority um, members uh, of our staff network group. We've been working very closely with our senior management team and our human resources team, and also our, our allies um, in Hertfordshire. We've been working closely with them and also working with other staff network groups in Hertfordshire. So these are our committee members. Our committee members have a wealth of knowledge, skills, experience, and we work across a range of different areas um, in Hertfordshire. I'm pleased that Arthur Lewis, I believe, is here um, today. Um, and we give this strategic direction to the staff network group, and we have worked really well together over the past 18 months. Just to share some Hertfordshire data with you, this is from the Diversity and Inclusion Report of 2018 to 2019. Um, just in terms of the national data, um, my figures agree with Kate, which is really great. Um, the percentage of people from black and ethnic minority groups has increased from 11% in 2001 to 19% in 2011. And then just thinking about our workforce in Hertfordshire, our Black and Asian and minority ethnic staff has increased from 13.9% in 2018 to 14.5% in 2019. We've seen some increases in our apprentices in Hertfordshire, 19.8% from a black and minority ethnic staff group. I don't have any figures for our, uh, our graduates, but it's an area that I think we'd like to see some, some improvements um, in. In terms of our um, younger staff joining Hertfordshire, we can see that there are 36% of people under 25. So that means we've got some young people um, coming up in the organization, which is really good. An area that we feel needs some more um, development is within our senior management roles in Hertfordshire. At the moment, that stands at 12.1% of senior managers from a black and minority ethnic group um, are in our top 5% of earners. This slide is really just to share with you some of the um, events of this year. As a staff group, we pull together our terms of reference and our governance for the group, which we started to share with our members in February this year. 
we held some site meetings at Farnham House and Apsley and meetings were uh, planned to take place at County Hall and at Mundell's. Um, but unfortunately, the first wave of COVID um, impacted on any face-to-face -face meetings. So they were put on um, hold um, for some time. In June of 2020, we started to have some discussions with our human resources teams, particularly around the impact, as we've heard already, the impact of COVID on the significant impact, I should say, of COVID on our staff from black and minority ethnic communities. And we were instrumental in setting up a webinar for staff to be able to um, have some questions answered about their worries, their concerns. And we had our senior management team involved with that. We had approximately 250 staff attending that session. And I understand that more people had wanted to attend that too. In August um, of 2020, uh, we developed a Let's Talk Toolkit um, of which Caroline Headley has been the pioneer of that. Um, the Let's Talk Toolkit has been um, devised into two parts, um, looking at how we can start to talk openly and honestly about race and racism and diversity and inclusion issues. The first part of the toolkit is about preparing for those conversations. And the second part of that toolkit is about having those difficult conversations. I understand it's been rolled out to quite a few teams and has been received really positively. In September 2020, we started having regular meetings with our chief executive, Owen Mapley, and these have been really positive. And as a staff network group, we've also been involved in the Diversity and Inclusion Week, where my colleagues Caroline uh, Headley and Liz Fergus presented to the, to the meeting. In October 2020, we held our, our Black History Month schedule of events. I'll go on to talk about that in a bit more detail later on. And for November, I'm representing us here at the Forward View Conference, and we hope to have another webinar in, in either December or January um, of 2021. As a BAME staff network group, we have pulled together our own strategy because we felt it was important for us as a staff network group to be working on our own strategic objectives. So we have four um, key areas that we're looking at. Learning and development, where we're focusing on the training and training and skills for our staff from black and minority ethnic communities. We're looking at our anti-racism strategy and working towards an inclusive workplace. In regards to recruitment and opportunities, we're looking at tackling unfairness in recruitment and how we can make our processes much more transparent and fairer. And lastly, inclus inclusive leadership. We'd like to have an organisational approach. And as I've said earlier, we'd like to see a growth in our senior managers from black and minority ethnic communities. Moving on to Black History Month, there are quite a few slides about this because it has been such a huge achievement and a huge success. So we wanted to spend some time sharing this with you all. We held a number of coffee mornings during October. In fact, we had one each week. We decided to um, have the meetings for both our black and minority ethnic staff and our allies too. We felt that that would allow conversations to be had uh, with both black and white staff in an open and transparent way. The sessions were attended by between 50 and 60 staff. They were held virtually. And I think we had some real connectedness and richness of conversations with, with our colleagues. We also had an interview um, that was set up with Gary Young, who's a journalist and author and broadcaster. Um, Gary Young was born and brought up in Hertfordshire. And we also had an interview with Lionel Wallace, who's here today. So thank you again, Lionel, for being involved in that with us. Both these interviews have added to our Hertfordshire memories and it has added to the history of black and minority ethnic staff in Hertfordshire. 
both these interviews are still available on the Hertfordshire Memories if anyone would like to have a look at those. We also had a tremendous collaboration with Marion Hill and the staff from Hertfordshire Archives and Library Services and we will continue to work in collaboration with Marion and the team moving forward in our preparations for Black History Month next year. We were very pleased that the Local Government Association, which is the government body that has responsibility for local, local authorities, was asking Hertfordshire what we had intended to do for Black History Month. And we wrote a report to them and they were very impressed with our, our plans for Black History Month. And we believe a report was sent to the House of Commons that mentioned the work that we were doing uh, for Black History Month. We also shared a Hearts um, Hidden Histories um, DVD with both our staff and our county councillors, two separate sessions. Uh, this DVD is about Hertfordshire's involvement in slavery and its abolition. It's a DVD which is of its time and the feedback received was very positive but we, do, we are aware that this DVD, DVD should be updated to include some recent history, as well as the past histories around slavery and its abolition. We also uh, had a DVD screening in the evening, this was, of the Home Sweet Halston um, DVD, which is about the Windrush generation. So again, with being in the spirit of being um, doing something different this year, we included information about the Windrush generation, and this information was also included in the Hearts Memories um, area of Hearts um, Library Services. We've had some great feedback from Black History Month. I'll just share just a few because I'm very mindful of the time. Um, so one of the comments was that this was the best Black History Month we've had in Hertfordshire. Chris Badger, our acting or interim director for adult care services. Today's session was fascinating. Thanks so much for organising. We really enjoyed Black History Month. Lionel's interview was great and the Windrush virtual exhibition was great too. It takes a lot to organise these things and I know you do it on your spare time. So I wanted to say a thanks from me. The session that we had with the county councillors, we were really impressed that our councillors gave up their time. I think we had between 14 and 16 councillors attended the session. Um, just to share a couple of the um, comments. Thank you. It was exceptionally informative and broadened my understanding considerably. And thank you for organising the event. Lionel Wallace has given permission to share this comment as well. Um, it would be great to keep in touch on these important themes because we are planning to do some further work with Lionel going forward and very well done to you all for facilitating the conversation. We wanted to share some memories with you of our Black History Month event last year. Obviously with the impact of Covid uh, we couldn't have any face-to-face -face sessions. I think it meant that we were much more creative in, in some respects. Um, but these are just some memories of when we were able to have face-to-face -face, um, exhibitions. The um, picture on the top left, my top left, um, is from the Diversity and Inclusion event of 2019. The bottom left-hand corner is an event that we had for our senior management colleagues and councillors where we brought in food from our various diverse backgrounds and we shared that with our, our colleagues and the senior managers. And the other two pictures are from the um, Black History Month event in 2019. So in terms of the next steps for the Black and Asian minority ethnic group, we want to really build on the hard work that's already been completed in 2019 and this year. We want to continue to develop our strategy and to put in place um, an implementation plan with some real key actions around that and what we would like to achieve and how we involve our colleagues, our colleagues in our human resources team, our senior managers in making that a reality in Hertfordshire. 
We also want to continue to strengthen our relationships with our Hertfordshire Archive and Library Services, with our human resources team, with our senior management colleagues, with our allies and with anyone else who would really like to work with us. And finally, we really want to broaden the delivery of the Let's Talk Toolkit in Hertfordshire. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Elaine. That was absolutely superb. Really stirring stuff. And you're getting loads of plaudits through on the on the chat from from colleagues. Um, the um, it's a great model for other organisations that uh, that you're presenting there. Um, and there's a lot of call for the Let's Talk uh, toolkit. Um, to, from colleagues in St Albans and Eastern North Hertfordshire, they all want to share it with you. So I'm sure uh, Hertfordshire Forward is going to find some ways of, uh, of making that possible. Um, and of course, what you've really done is just stoke up excitement uh, as to uh, Lionel Wallace's uh, presentation and what we're going to hear from Lionel. Um, so you've been a great, uh, a great warm up act. <laughs> and it's an absolute delight now to welcome to the stage Lionel Wallace, aeronautical engineer for 15 minutes on uh, how, what our response as a county should be. Lionel, over to you. Thank you, Toby, and thank you for Elaine. Thank you very much for that. Um, Lionel Wallace, I'm glad to be with you uh, this morning. Aeronautical engineer, one category, but really what I am is I'm a passionate uh, person about um, hope for young people. I'm uplifted by faith. Um, I'm blessed sometimes to be ceremony um, representing Her Majesty the Queen. I am unashamedly black. I'm high sheriff in nomination for 2021-22. I'm proudly British by choice, and I'm indulgently Afro-Caribbean. I'm unique, just like every one of you. And um, Hertfordshire is my home. And one of the things that I think that we've heard today, which really pleases me, um, David mentioned it, Kate mentioned it, I think, uh, Elaine also mentioned it, is that um, everybody is an individual. And I think this whole subject that we're discussing today and if we're going to be successful, not only in Hertfordshire, but in the wider community in dealing with this, we've got to understand that people um, are individuals. Um, so whilst, you know, people might have concerns about the, 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 the Black Lives Matter movement, I mean, I think the first thing I want to say is that we have to understand that the Black Lives Matter is really crying out, all lives matter. Uh, so trying to mask it by diversions uh, um, and complaints about that term really is, I, in my opinion, really unhelpful. We've got to understand the story. You know, you go back to people like Edward Long, who wrote these very controversial, I think probably crit criminal publications, degrading black people uh, and people of color as subhuman. Um, and lots of people believed it. And these are histories that we've got to understand. And you go back to slavery, the slave trade, Britain's involvement in it, the world's involvement with it. World War One, World War Two, discrimination, segregation, Windrush, the lot. And when we look at these things, you've got to say, in my opinion, that actually um, everybody's come through a, a really different story. And if we forget that or if we negate it, we're not going to hit the mark, in my opinion. I'm glad to see Kate picked up the uh, um, the uh, the statistics on race. Every part of the United Kingdom, the highest hate crime is race. Um, and Hertfordshire is no different. Um, trumped only by Cambridgeshire in our region, uh, who are up something like 79, I think, percent. It would be really great um, if we had a plan to make sure we could see year on year decrease in the amount of racial hate crimes. Um, of course, it's increased since May the 25th when we all watched on TV um, the activities that happened to George Floyd. Uh, nobody can ever say again, um, that they weren't aware that this was a problem. And that's been a stimulus, I think, for a lot of things that are happening and really good, but it could also go the wrong way if we don't um, take the right moves. So we've got to be proactive, I think, in dismantling systems that hinder progress on race relations. And people talk about system, um, systematic or institutionalized racism, sometimes very contentious, but there are some things that we can do there. Um, but I think actually it's really important also to make sure that we take care not to overdo it. Um, it it's equity, I, in my opinion, leading to equality. So we've got to do some pushes like we're doing with things like BAME groups, et cetera. Um, but people of color are not seeking supremacy uh, as what might have been sought in, in previous years. 
and we we can we can push the boundary too far if we don't keep really keen eye on what the objective is here so you haven't got to put black people on every single poster you produce um or go over the way because that's actually going to cause another problem you've got to be really balanced about what we're doing and what we're saying to the community law um 2010 equality act is great and it exists, but law doesn't deliver what we need. And there's examples of that. Social acceptance, social behavior is generally speaking what we see that delivers the sort of results that makes um, community cohesion um, really successful. Drinking, driving, you know, talking to my, my, my children, talking to their friends and how they take a responsible act um, uh, approach to not drinking and driving. Well, it's not the law that's doing that. It's because they get in this peer group and they all decide that actually this isn't cool. So it's got to become not cool for um, hate crime associated with race. And we, every single one of us is really uh, having to be involved in that. And I'm a little nervous actually as to whether sometimes if we see too many wholly black groups establishing positions whether we'll get in a position, if I can just open the conversation, whether white people will feel left out, because that's not the purpose either, is it? The purpose is actually that we're all going to sort of come together. So what we're doing at the moment in equity and BAME groups and the great things that Elaine's talked to us about and the, the figures that we've seen from Kay is great. But there's got to be a roadmap, in my view, to almost extinction or a planned extinction of some of these groups if we're going to be really be successful, because the objective isn't devising individual groups the objective is saying actually all lives matter how do we love each other if i put it that way um to a position where we can all progress so the written law is not going to do it the heart and we've got a great county name haven't we the heart in hertfordshire has to start here and everybody has to be part of that um, you know we can run from the problem or we can face it head on and i think that these sort of groups and these sort of activities help us to face the problem um, head on. We have to come, we have to uh, commence, we've got to begin, we've got to support the conversation. And uh, perhaps it's necessary for incumbents of people in power to do um, greater things, things that they haven't done before, maybe they've not thought about it, um, to invite wider participation, etc. All of those things. But we're not talking about theoretical quotas, we're talking about genuine people with a heart for change, which is really, really important. So what actions should organizations take uh, to contribute to removing racism and discrimination? Well, um, there's great and there's less good, perhaps I should say really bad, um, practice examples existing all over the country of what can be done. And I'm not here really to say what all of the answers are. I don't have all the answers. My experience as a black person living and loving Harbinger is very different to some of my siblings, very, very different to my parents when they came over and the experiences they had. And thank God that they pushed through it with some determination and allowed me to have a different experience. And I, I, I think that's really important to remember that even if we're the same color, we don't have the same experience necessarily. And that has to be taken into account. So we've got to facilitate the conversation. Talking, loving is really important. Generally, some people have never thought about this subject. Really, they haven't. Um, they, 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 and, and to facilitate the conversation where they can be awoken, uh, awaken uh, to the subject is really, really going to be important. So finishing, one of the things that really impacted me in my life uh, growing up in Hertfordshire, uh, many of the community activities or uh, uh, um, organisations that I've been involved in um, over Hertfordshire, including the County Council, and I'm, I'm tremendously proud of what our County Council are doing uh, to address this subject is an experience I had of being invited uh, to one of Her Majesty's garden parties when I was uh, much younger in uh, International Youth Year. And I went along and I wouldn't like to say I was the only black person there, but I definitely stood out, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, we, it, 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 we were put into these little groups where you, 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 you tend to be if you're going to um, uh, um, meet members of the royal family um as as a group they were and i wasn't chosen for one of these groups which is okay i was just very happy to be there it was a, it was a tremendous honor to be invited anyway and um princess diana um god bless her um walked down she was she went to one of these groups and she was talking to the groups and we were all sort of looking on 
And, uh, and then she started walking across and she stopped. And she turned around and she looked at me and she walked straight towards me and started talking to me. And I can tell you, I felt good. And why did I feel good? Because I'd been recognized. And do you know what happened after that? It allowed lots of people who weren't interacting with people who looked like me to then feel that they could do so as well. And I think that this problem can be solved relatively easy if every individual on this call and everybody we can hope to get a, 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 a attached to this activity takes it upon themselves to say, actually, it's not up to somebody else to change something. It's actually up to me to change something. It's up to me to perhaps go across the canteen and sit with the group of people who don't look like me and find out what their stories are um, and the other group and, 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 and actually demonstrate that it's not just about the numbers. It's not about the metrics, it's about the heart. Go and have a coffee with somebody, enter the group that maybe you haven't done before recognize achievement um, and recognize that people who haven't been achieving for a long time are not always recognized for it. That's something that we can do. Reverse mentoring is really good. So we often have people who are mentored by their superiors, but why not get people who are lower down the chain, um, particularly a lot of young people, and this is gonna be one of my um, passions in 2021-22, God's Bear Life. Um, Getting young people who have grown up in a slightly different culture as well, and some of these issues are, uh, are, are natural, or I would say in some respects alien to them, to be mentors for all, older people who don't have the same experience is really good. But to finalize, I'd say the key thing we have to do is, and relatively simply, in my opinion, is to make people feel at home in Hertfordshire. It's a delightful place. And why do we have to make people feel at home? It's because many people of color, people who might be in the BAME category, whatever they want to identify themselves as, have been positively told to go back home to somewhere else. And maybe a place they've never even been. And that's one of the things I think we can all solve. If we can make people feel at home, then we'll begin to understand how to solve this problem. And it's up to every one of us. People are following you as leaders and I hope that they're following you to the right destination. Thank you. Fantastic, Lionel, thank you. Um, Denise, uh, out in the audience, says she could listen to you all day and I'm sure, I'm sure she's speaking for all of us in, in, in that. Um, so, some great points you're making there. The need for, for balanced responses to achieve balanced outcomes. Um, the, the idea that culture beats law every time and, and we've got to change the culture. Uh, and and the, the best way of doing that is, is, is by talking, by just actually interacting with other people on an individual level. And I'm sure everyone watching The Crown uh, is finding, uh, like I am, uh, that, that Princess Diana is becoming more of a human being uh, with every episode. And, and one of the great lessons to take out of that series, I guess, is um, that it's about individual action and, 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 and your experience with her. It's, it, you don't have to wait to be told by your organization what to do. You can do it yourself. It's not hard to make someone feel at home. No. It's, it's up to us to say, hello, how are you? What can I do for you? And if everyone does that, then there'll be um, some, some real, uh, real progress made. So thank you very much indeed for that, Lionel. That's brilliant. And thanks to all our panelists uh, for your presentations. Now, it's over to you, audience. We're going to ask you some questions. And we've got some polls that are about to appear uh, on your screens. Um, I'm going to uh, talk you through each one and ask you to respond to each one. There are five in, in total over the next couple of minutes. Um, and, and the first uh, is um, around uh, the joint statement issued earlier this year from Hertfordshire public sector organizations against every form of discrimination, racism, and injustice. Were you aware of that joint statement? Uh, and I'm gonna ask David, while you respond to that, David, what sort of reaction do you think we're gonna get? How, how good do you think um, was, the, was the promotion and the, and, and the distribution of that joint statement? Well, I'd like to think, Toby, that the audience that we've got um, is obviously quite a, um, a narrowly focused audience and that they may be more likely to have seen um, those comments. Um, but, you know, being realistic about communicating from the county councils or from the public sector, um, 
to be honest, um, you know, we have relatively limited reach in yes. terms of being able to get our messages across um, compared with all the other media and, uh, and, and all the ways that people now get their news. Um, but I'd like to think that our audience here this morning um, uh, would have been aware of some of these statements, whether it was Owen's statement, whether it was my statement, or then the, um, uh, the cross um, public sector statement. Well, it's, it's a little unfair to be uh, ambushing our panel in this way, um, but I can now uh, pull back the curtain and reveal that the answer is around about half of, of uh, our audience uh, were, were clearly aware of it. Um, quite a large proportion unsure, which I guess uh, counts as a, as a no. So there's work to be done. But I think this probably plays back into what Lionel was saying, which is that this is about individual actions. And if, if, you know, if you're aware of a, of a statement like this, it's up to us to make other people aware. We can't all rely on other people and other organisations to do these things for us. Um, OK, let's move on to the, the second poll. Um, this is, uh, does the organisation you are representing today have a di diversity and inclusion strategy? Uh, now, Elaine, you, you've clearly got a lot of involvement in this, uh, in this sort of area. How widespread do you think your sort of approach um, to, um, to activity within organisations is? Do you think most organisations in, in Hertfordshire viewing today are going to be um, rep, uh, ha have a diversity and inclusion strategy? We would say that I think most organisations in Hertfordshire will have a diversity and inclusion strategy, so I think that would be quite high in my experience. It's actually really impressively high. It's over 80%, <laughs> which, is, which is great news, I guess, um, uh, and, and uh, gives us a real sort of foundations to, um, to, to, to take some of these actions and, and um, uh, drive some of these policies through. Um, so yeah, 83% of all organizations in, in represented today have a diversity and inclusion yeah. strategy. Of course, it's a self-selecting audience uh, to a certain extent, and it would be nice if 83% if were true throughout organizations mm. in Hertfordshire. Okay, question three. Uh, do you feel, viewers, that the public sector, such as the county council, district councils, police, NHS, etc., engages and connects well with black, Asian and ethnic minority communities. So how well is the public sector doing out there? Um, Kate, uh, what's, you, what's your view in, with all the organizations that you've got kind of contact with and, and your work in Hertfordshire, do you feel that the audience is going to feel that the public sector is engaging well? Mm, not as much as they should. Mm. It's so difficult though, because you know we are talking of all sorts of barriers whether it's a personal one or a, or a mm. community one, but it's also barriers on the other side. Mm. I'm all for myth busting because we all have a perception of whether the service is for me or not for me, and it's only for them, um, and no one's interested in me. So as Lionel said, this is, this is our time, each and every one of us, to speak, to, to um, be inclusive about whether it's a social event or a business event or a professional um, actual outing. But no, there's still a lot more work to be done with communication. Yeah, well, you're, you're spot on. 50% of the audience agree. Um, so 50% so are saying that the public sector needs to do more to engage uh, and connect with Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities, um, which you know, is, is why we're here today. Um, that, that's, that's, that's what we're doing here today, isn't it? Um, okay, let's move on to our next question, which is, Stop sharing those ones and move on to question four. Um, do you feel, audience, that the voluntary and community sector engages and connects well with the Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities? Um, let's go back to, um, to Kate again with this one, because Kate, that is your sector, isn't it? Uh, do you feel that, that the groups such as yourselves are, are engaging well? No, I've heard from my colleagues, you know, they provide excellent services, but they still ask the question, how do we reach? This wonderful notion, three words, hard to reach. Well, actually we're not hard to reach, we're difficult to engage. Mm. We know where people are, but is how do we make that step change? How do we get, how do we engage them to, to share whatever um, needs, you know, to, to improve services? So no, we, we still have got a lot more to do. Yeah, and that's that's reflected in the audience uh, views as well. Although, interestingly, 50, 54% of our audience is unsure 
about whether the voluntary and community, community sector is engaging uh, well. And that, that probably reflects the fact that they're not in that, um, yes. that sector. But maybe there's a communication job there to be done uh, as, as well. Similarly, um, yes, uh, right across the public sector. Interesting stuff. Thank you, audience. Right. Finally, uh, would you like to see the public sector doing more to celebrate the diversity of Hertfordshire communities? And I'm, I'm going to almost tell you, audience, that the answer to that is absolutely yes, if it means that we get to hear more from Elaine, Lionel, mm -hmm. Kate and David uh, at sessions like this. Um, OK, we can almost stop the survey after 15 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, it's anonymous, so we won't know who you are if you say no. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely uh, um, unanimous, 100% uh, uh, yes in favour of um, seeing the public sector do more to celebrate the diversity <laughs> of Hertfordshire communities. Um, you'll understand, viewers, that, that uh, while, while that may be a, an unnecessary poll to, uh, to take, um, it, it does help to have statistical backing like that for um, the, the programme that Hertfordshire Forward uh, takes forward. OK, that's brilliant. Let's um, let's have a discussion. Let's have a conversation. I've been scribbling down questions all the way through this session and there are lots that have come through on the chat. Viewers, if you can put those into the Q&A, it makes it much easier for us to understand what the question is because the chat sort of scrolls past and it's hard for our panel to catch hold of it. But can I start with something that um, it was a conversation in the chat that started very early during this session, and that's about the use of the phrase BAME. Um, I, and and it's, it's a tricky one because we're asking, we're looking for a phrase that collects together a, a group of really diverse uh, communities. So how can any one word reflect such diversity? But we need shortcuts. We need ways of expressing things in, in simple and, 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 and sound bitey kind of ways to get messages across. So can I put that to the panel? Um, is, is BAME the right phrase to use? And if it isn't, how do we go about finding some way of, of, of talking about these diverse communities, our diverse communities? Um, Let's uh, start at the top of, of my screen with Elaine. Mm, I think I think the term is a helpful term. However, I think what we what can happen is that the we're, we're not a homogenous group, and mm. areas of the pa panel members have talked about this already. And there are some issues that might affect someone from a Black African Caribbean origin more than someone from another group. And somehow that term can just hide a number of issues for different people within that group. So I would probably like to see a new terminology and maybe um, minority ethnic groups. I was on a webinar yesterday and that was a, a phrase being used, uh, minority ethnic groups. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's time to relook at, at that phraseology. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine. I mean, it is difficult because by definition, by reducing everyone to a single word, you are going to be exclusionary. It's just a, yeah, it's a, it's just one of those sort of conundrums, isn't it? But thanks yeah. for that. Um, Simon Alton, who I've, I've had the pleasure of sharing a screen with in, in the past, has made a really helpful comment as well. He's, he said that um, what stood out for him uh, following Kate's presentation was that we all need to be prepared to have difficult conversations and have to accept without fear or judgment that we will be wrong at times. And I think that's probably a really helpful contribution to, to that particular thread. Um, let's take that to, to you, Lionel. Um, feel free to pick up on, on uh, that idea of, uh, of, of the phrase BAME. But also we've got a question direct to you from uh, Kulbir uh, uh, Lali. Iali, I, 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 I do beg your pardon, Kulbir. Um, on your thoughts on the exclusion of so much history in schools to create the awareness and peer response to make it unacceptable like drink driving. So do we need more in schools to help drive that cultural change that you were talking about? I think we definitely need more in schools. We could do a lot more in schools in terms of the history. And I think that this is another one of the discussions and the conversations that we have to have about making ourselves vulnerable. I like what you said about the gentleman, I can't remember the name, who mentioned about um, we've got to be prepared to get it wrong. Um, one of the problems we have is that people are afraid of getting it wrong. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They're afraid of offending. Um, all of these things stop and freeze the conversation. And they're because people are afraid that um, they're going to get a negative reaction from the other people. If we create a community where I'm very happy for you to, to call me something that, um, uh, that isn't quite what you should, and I'll recognize 
if you're doing it out of malice exactly. or, whether you've just, or whether you've just made a mistake. Yeah. I'm happy to accept the mistake and I will forgive you for the mistake mm -hmm. if your heart is for me. This is the problem we have in community. We're trying to do things too perfect. And we've got to get, first of all, the heart of people changed to say, actually, do we actually want to work together with each other? And do we love each other? And then we can deal with these very difficult conversations and we can change the curriculum and understand that just because we tell people about the horrendous activities of the slave trade and slavery and the things that, um, that, that, that people we might identify with or the society we identify with today got wrong, it doesn't mean that they're at fault. And they, then we're gonna criticize them. We just wanna learn what went wrong so that we can, we can make it different for the future. This is the problem. So we have to start, everybody has to start with an individual position that says, um, I'm, I'm prepared to be vulnerable in this situation. I'll hold my hands up, uh, but this is my heart. This is my heart for you. And if I get it wrong, please forgive me. This is it. Yeah. So it's back back to people again, isn't it? Um, and, and it's interesting that the Welsh government, I think, has just published today um, a, a catalogue of all the monuments in Wales that have some sort of connection to uh, slavery. And, and as a first step towards understanding uh, the cultural impact that that has had, I think that's really useful, actually. I think it'll surprise a lot of people in Wales to find out just how um, immersed in, in, in their culture that, that is. Yeah. But Kate, you wanted to come in on this. No, I was just saying, can we all have a sense of curiosity? Can we just ask, you know, and Lionel, thank you for that. And we, because of our skin tone, we absolutely, you know, almost intuitively know when someone is being pretty disrespectful, pretty aggressive, or being curious and go, what happens in your culture? What is, you know, how does that work? And what, et cetera, about our history as well. But with you, Lionel, I'm British, <laughs> love, love living in Hertfordshire. My kids and, and their other halves all love that. And so let's have a sense of more humanity. We're all people, we all have differences, but it's all right to talk about it. And let's be more curious about each other and your background and your heritage and less of the judgment. What's with the judgments? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's echoing again, Simon Alton's uh, comments earlier. Thanks, thanks, Kate. Um, it, it, it's, this is all about people, isn't it? When it comes down to it. Yes. Um, David, I, I invite you to, to comment on, on everything that's been said so far. And I'd also like to put to you uh, another question that's come up during the chat, which is about being more proactive to engage with harder to reach groups uh, that don't necessarily, not the most vocal, um, that, that don't necessarily connect to existing resources. And, and, and is, there, is there work that can be done uh, to reach them too? So uh, just commenting on the, um, on the uh, sort of history and the understanding, you know, it's always struck me, Toby, that um, in GCSE or O-level syllabuses, you know, we, we used to do chunks of history and there were these huge gaps uh, that we knew nothing about whatsoever, the Reformation or whatever it might have been. And I think that's a little bit, it's a little bit like that in terms of um, uh, uh, black history. Uh, interestingly, the, um, I do remember meeting the Church of England uh, minister from Hitchin, I don't know if Kate knows him, who is something of a national expert in terms of uh, the history of um, uh, the Indian subcontinent and the part of the British in that leading on to segregation and separation. Um, and he has sought to introduce um, almost a syllabus um, covering that um, in, in our schools. And uh, so that to me is a, you know, is a really good example of understanding other people's backstory. Uh, and certainly you know, in terms of the Indian subcontinent, um, you know, if you've watched Who Do You Think You Are and seen some of <laughs> you know, Michelle Hussein or people like that and uh, appreciating their story, it is absolutely um, mind boggling. Um, so um, then in terms of harder to reach groups, um, I mean, Kate shared, you know, some of the languages that um, mm -hmm. are uh, prominent in, in Hertfordshire. Um, it is difficult um, 
uh, you, when you get down to a community level and a community group level, I think it is possible to reach out. Um, COVID has helped. Um, uh, you know, WhatsApp and Facebook has helped um, as streets have joined up and are looking after each other and collecting people's shopping and uh, getting prescriptions delivered. Um, so I think technology has something, has a bit of a part to play. And dare I say it, the pandemic and all of the challenges of the pandemic have, I'd like to think, um, made people recognize, you know, I have been very conscious of outbreaks in Watford, um, in uh, Boreham Wood, um, of the virus, which have been linked to um, people's ethnicity. And, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, one of the reasons that the County Council became so focused uh, that we, we realized we, uh, we were behind the curve in terms of our engagement with our Black and Asian uh, minority ethnic staff was the recognition that so many of our frontline staff involved in adult social care and children's social care, so people like Elaine, um, who were not working from home, were out on the front line visiting families, um, were of a Black and Asian minority ethnic uh, background. So there have been these real challenges, these wake-up calls, and I'd like to think as a consequence, we can engage more with those. We, we are finding um, some of those more harder to reach groups across the county. Yeah. Kate, would you like to, um, to come in on that, uh, on, on, on the issue of, um, of uh, whether and how um, we can become more proactive to reach harder to reach groups and, and go past the sort of the more vocal of, the, of, of minorities? I suppose the starting point is there are, you know, groups that are known now to us from what I call the mutual aid, plus the well-established groups. C go and talk to them. Mm. Let's not reinvent the wheel. You know, and from there, when people and the communities need to learn to trust again, they need to have the confidence that, because I hear it sometimes, like, well, what's the point, Kate? Mm. We've been saying this for da 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 and nothing has happened. Mm. So with this crisis that we're in, this is our moment. That's all of us, all of us, those in the profession. We need to listen and hear and develop services which are appropriate and, and relevant to people's lives. Our lives have all changed. You know, um, our histories are, are, are older, as Lionel has said, our parents' experiences are quite different to ours. And our children's experiences are different to, to ours as well. And some of them will go, oh, you know, oh, that's old stuff. We, we're not interested in that. <laughs> we are here, you know, um, and, and, and so on. But go to the established groups now and then world will get out and we can move on from that. It's gonna be organic, it's gonna be painful and it's going to be long. Yeah, All this funding now, and my little twitch is that this money is being resourced. Mm. We're going to access it. What's it going to look like in two years' time? Yeah, the squeeze Are is coming. Are we still going to be talking about this? Mm. Sorry. No, no, end, that's end that's, of session. That's fantastic, Kate. Thank you so much for your contribution. And of course, I didn't mean go past um, more vocal uh, groups. What I meant was not be satisfied by only reaching the, the more vocal groups. There are other people out there who we're, we're just not hearing from. Um, Elaine, um, I'd, I'd like you to pick up on that as well. But also, um, we've got a cry for help from Joe Heaney in the audience. Um, he's saying that um, we have tried so hard to encourage membership of our trustee board from people of all backgrounds so as to promote inclusion and have been singularly unsuccessful successful. Uh, oh, we see no. a predominantly white male retired businessman wanting to be a trustee. We even struggle to get women trustees. Help, please. Elaine, what's the one thing that you would say uh, you've got to go out and do, Joe, to, um, to, to, to encourage diversity in your, in your trustees? Um, I think Joe's going to really need to reach out to, to make people from a black and minority ethnic minority group feel that they can take on those roles. Um, 
I think it's really, really important that we don't feel, because sometimes it can feel as though um, these roles are not for me because of I'm a black woman, this isn't a role for me and that somebody might already be earmarked for that particular role. So I think it's really important that, that people reach out to, to us um, for these particular roles. Yes. Yeah, thanks Elaine. Really and wonderful. Lionel. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things is, um, there's a lot of work that's being done to reach out to communities and much more that can be done. I think you've got to understand that Equally, for a lot of the communities and or individuals in the black space, their experience is such that they're suspicious about it. <laughs> so, 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 so why are you talking to me? You've never talked to me before. You, you will get the best engagement if you form a relationship first uh, in terms of understanding, actually, I'm trying to actually just make you feel at home. I'm trying to be friend, et cetera. And then there is an obligation on the, uh, the people of color, the BAME communities, everybody else to engage. So uh, they, they, we maybe won't be able to expect that they do that out of their own initiative because this, there's this fear there that this is not for me. You know, how many black people or people of color or BAME or minority groups have even been in the door of County Hall? I mean, the I have to be honest, the first time I walked in there, I thought to myself, I hope I don't get lost because nobody will find me in this building. Um, you know what I mean? Am I going to get? Am I going to get kidnapped? So there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a presence to the establishments we've got that is just horrendously difficult for people to engage with out of their own initiative. So they have to be invited potentially first and form a relationship, and then when I think you see the confidence of the relationship and the trust it takes work build, we'll get much more engagement. It starts with us creating the home and the trust first. If you set up only the systems, it won't bring the people. It's also about the cause. Hello, Joe. Um, if people, individuals, if I was passionate about what your charity is about, I will make that first approach. And I, then I will gauge whether you're very welcoming or not. <laughs> and then do I have a, a, can I make a difference in this charity? And how will that look like, how it works? People are associate with a charity of, and their cause. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, and, and, you know, we should feel comfortable at participating. And why are you putting a barrier up? Oh, because you don't look like us. <laughs> mm, yeah. And I think Kate, sorry, sorry, sorry. Stop. Kate, would you, would you agree? Um, and I've been on lots of committees that sometimes we're not very good as organizations of specifically saying to the person why we want them to join. If yes. you want them to join because you want a black face on the committee, please don't do this. Yes, yeah. We've yeah. there was some trustee yeah. training a few weeks ago and that was exactly yeah. the question is, yeah. why are you looking for, Yeah. why yeah. is it just to do the, oh, I, I need my 5% yeah. Um, yeah. woman, <laughs> disabled yeah. Yeah. do you know what i mean is the the board has to question why do we need to have one and you need and to then know. go for it and you as a as a prospective trustee need to know what it is you're going to be asked to contribute why exactly. why what what are you bringing to to the table um david david over to you um to to, to pick up on, on on any of these uh any of these threads and and as you're doing it um bear in mind the um panel that we're getting a request for all of you to speak at different events and take part with different <laughs> organizations and so so we will bundle all of that up for you after this session and put it um into into email so so those connections viewers with the panel will be made and you will also receive um you'll be able to access the whole of the video of this session and all of the slides on on the hertfordshire forward website afterwards but um david are there any of those threads that you'd like to pick up on? well i just uh, particularly wanted to uh, refer to joe's uh, point and you know if i look across the 500 odd councillors there are in um uh, in hertfordshire we are not a very diverse group uh, at all mm. Um, you know, I'm uh, I'm struggling to identify as far as the county council is concerned. Um, we have a few Jewish members, and I'd uh, particularly uh, highlight uh, Asif Khan, who's one of the um, uh, the councillors in Watford. But that's about it. So political parties have exactly the same problem as you. Yeah. Although um, I do have um, I do have a black MP, um, 
uh, now and a very young black MP, um, which uh, is, you know, hopefully a step in the right direction. Um, one thing I've got to mention, Toby, just very quickly before we finish, mm. um, this may be of interest to those who are watching, um, the decision to be made about which tier areas go into when we come out of the national lockdown arrangements uh, on the 2nd of December. And Hertfordshire is going to go into tier two, um, the so-called high, um, the, the middle tier. It is interesting to me when I've been looking at the list of um, areas which are um, very high, then Lancashire, the West Midlands, Slough uh, are on that list. And, um, you know, that says something in terms of the uh, ethnicity and the mix, the population mixes in those um, uh, in those communities mm. and some of the challenges that are being faced locally. And, and, you know, we do know that there are so many factors that are contributing to more um, black and Asian minority ethnic um, people um, being in the firing line when it comes to COVID for one reason or another, yeah. um, more often not to do with deprivation, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just it's another challenge for, for, for us to overcome. But I, if there's one if there's one silver lining to, to COVID, maybe it is that it's highlighting this inequality and, and, and this uh, systemic uh, racism in, in the country and enabling us to do something about it. Maybe we're all being empowered by what we're going through right now. Uh, uh, to, to um, pursue mm. the sorts of policies and activities that Elaine and Lionel and Kate and, and David have been t talking to us about today. Um, so viewers, um, we set out today uh, to consider issues and challenges for the county. Um, we, we are uh, well aware and acknowledge that they are there. Um, and we want to determine how they, they can be addressed in partnership with you to ensure that Hertfordshire remains the county of opportunity. And with your help and engagement and participation in the surveys and the q and A, I I feel we've achieved that. I hope you'll agree, viewers, and uh, I hope you'll agree with me also that we've been blessed by fantastic contributions from, from our panel today. After this session, how could we not feel a spirit of partnership? How could we not see the need for that partnership in facing the challenges ahead together? And in that spirit, please join me in thanking Councillor David Williams, the leader at Hertfordshire County Council. And thank you, Kate Bellinis, uh, Deputy Lieutenant and Chair of the Hertfordshire Equality Council and CEO of Community Development Action Hertfordshire. And Elaine Hickling, thank you, uh, Business Improvement Manager at Hertfordshire County Council and Registered Social Worker. And thank you, not least, Aeronautical Engineer, but not just Aeronautical Engineer, Lionel Wallace, Deputy Lieutenant, and thanks to you out there as well, our probing, challenging, collegiate audience for contributing so much to this discussion. Um, it's a discussion that is going to continue. Your unanswered questions and, and, and your chat is all going to be uh, communicated to the panel, uh, and you can use the Hertfordshire Forward website to keep in touch with the sorts of conversations and, and materials that come out of that. You'll also find reports and videos from the whole um, series of Hertfordshire, uh, Hertfordshire Forward sessions there. We urge and encourage you to make use of this material in your work to make Hertfordshire better, stronger, together. Until next time, from our panel, from me, and from everyone at Hertfordshire Forward, good afternoon. <laughs>